Mario's back. Read all about it. It's NES Works episode 93. Long live King Smarty Smurf! Not that Brady Smurf! This week we reach a watershed moment for Nintendo and the NES. The debut of Super Mario Bros. 2. By which I mean the American Super Mario Bros. 2, not the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2. By this point I feel confident that everyone knows the story behind the origins of Mario 2 for NES. I personally have lived through the entire Mario 2 cycle. It's released back in 1988, it's gradual repudiation by fans once Super Mario Bros. 3 arrived in 1990 playing far more like the original Super Mario. Further dismissal once Super Mario All-Stars arrived in 1993, bringing with it the loss levels. Open contempt for the game as emulation made the original disc system title that established the framework for our Mario 2 accessible to an international audience. Gradual reacceptance among fans when Mario 2 returned for Game Boy Advance's launch and showed up on all of Nintendo's retro platforms, beginning with a virtual console. And finally, genuine renewed enthusiasm for Mario 2's unique nature and lasting influence on games like Super Mario 3D World. At this point, I think most of the world accepts Super Mario Bros. 2 for what it is, a game with a convoluted history that nevertheless holds an important place in the development of the Mario franchise, which has grown into the largest, most extensive franchise in video game history. Much of Mario's popularity in the West hinges on the formative ubiquity of the NES trilogy, and for all its quirks, Mario 2 did a great deal to define the Mario canon among American game enthusiasts of a certain age. Super Mario Bros. 2 arrived as the NES hit a market saturation point in America, the point at which practically every preteen or early adolescent either owned an NES or had friends who let them play their NES. Certainly I'm speaking for myself here, my brother and I went in together on an NES at the beginning of 1988. While his interest quickly waned, I found myself fascinated all that year by the few games I managed to save up enough money for. Metroid, Double Dragon, Castlevania, Metal Gear, and the countless games I borrowed from friends. And Super Mario Bros. 2 capped the year for me, a game so visually appealing, with its fluid cartoon renditions of the characters I had come to know through the original Super Mario, that I felt compelled to buy it despite having become burned out on the earlier Mario Adventure, which came packaged with my NES and was the only game we owned for several months. Nintendo's hype machine went into full force for Mario 2, taking the high-impact approach to marketing that they had explored with their surrealistic Zelda commercials to an entirely new level. Few of us could resist the one-two punch of store kiosks, television commercials, and the extensive multi-page spreads that dominated that copy of Nintendo Power 1 and 2 that showed up unannounced in all of our mailboxes a few months ahead of the game's arrival. Nintendo had been happy to sink a lot of money into its marketing efforts as the NES ascended, and 1988 saw promotional escalation that reminded one of the halcyon days of the Atari 2600. For their part, Nintendo continued to work to ensure that the NES would reproduce the good stuff about the 2600 era, which is to say the steady flow of increasingly sophisticated games and the copious flood of money without any of the bad stuff, like market crashes. Although trouble percolated in the wings as Atari and Namco's partnership in Tengen prepared to go rogue after delivering a trio of hits in Pac-Man, RBI Baseball, and Gauntlet, all kids could see at the time were games like Mario 2 and Zelda 2. Halcyon days. Mario 2, in particular, arrived at a perfect moment in NES history. The original Super Mario had debuted almost exactly three years earlier, and was included as a pack-in with millions of consoles since then. It may well have been the single most played game on the NES to that point, and it had begun to grow a little long in the tooth as more sophisticated software shipped for the system, hitting just in time for the first holiday season in which the NES enjoyed true ubiquity across America, Mario 2 couldn't have been anything less than a hit. It also became the first game to end up as the highly coveted Autumn Nintendo release, a gimmick the company would foster as a hype and sales driver for years to come. Where American parents had spent anxious weeks seeking Cabbage Patch Kids in the early 80s and Holiday 87 trying to find NES hardware, now Super Mario Bros. 2 took that honor, a rare sight at retail in those first few months until its early 1989 restock. The sight of the console's mascot Mario on a colorful new box that stood out from his previous titles for NES, no pixelated black box here, no off-model Donkey Kong Classics doodle, just a soon-to-be iconic drawing of Mario making a bold leap from the produce aisle. It made an impression. The comical style of the cover art also reflected the game inside, 
Unlike the straightforward and fairly repetitive graphics seen in Super Mario Bros., Mario 2's visuals featured a slightly exaggerated style that outlined characters and items and gave everything gently rounded corners to look more like a cartoon. And fittingly so, because Mario 2 felt more like a cartoon. Even more so than previous Mario games where eating a mushroom could grant you the power to grow tall and battle flying turtles, Mario 2 obeyed a surrealistic dream logic. It also featured an actual cast of characters. Building on from the Lost Levels, Mario 2 treated Luigi as a distinct character from his brother, capable of pulling off floaty leaps, but hindered by his lower physical stamina. And the scenery characters from Super Mario Bros., Princess Toadstool, and the mushroom retainer who constantly urged you to mosey along to another castle after besting one of Bowser's stand-ins, became protagonists in their own right. Toad moves and acts quickly but has a feeble jump, while the princess makes up for her lack of physical dexterity by standing in as the easy mode option. When players hold down the jump button, she hovers momentarily, allowing you to steer her for low-stress precision landings. The enemies burst with every bit as much personality. When the game ends, you don't see a staff roll with credits for the creators, but rather a cast list, showcasing all the monsters you've had to deal with. Some critters manage to be more memorable than others, naturally, but despite making a clean break from the original Mario Monster Pantheon, the denizens of the land of Subcon hold their own. This clean break from the shell creepers and goombas of Mario games past, as you well know, had less to do with a deliberate choice here to define the nature of a Mario game, and more to do with the fact that this didn't actually begin life as a Mario adventure. Super Mario Bros. 2 shipped in Japan for Famicom Disk System under the name Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic, a tie-in with a special event promoted by Fuji TV. The Mario cast slotted neatly into the roles previously held by Yume Kojo's cast, probably because Doki Doki Panic's underlying DNA owed a great deal to Super Mario Bros. Not only did it adopt a fair amount of that game's design and control physics, but it also emerged from design experiments to explore the possibility of integrating vertical elements to Super Mario's gameplay. Like the actual Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, Doki Doki Panic benefited from the technical flexibility afforded by the disk system hardware. Its development team, led by a newcomer named Kensuke Tanabe, had far more storage space to work with than the original Super Mario team did. And the disk system handled advanced scrolling functions more easily than a basic in-ROM mapper game ever could. Obviously, the disk system didn't reach America, so Nintendo converted the game to run on the same sort of MMC1 chip that had powered other disk system conversions like Metroid, Kid Icarus, and The Legend of Zelda. Well, not exactly like Zelda. Evidently, Mario didn't raid a special battery-backed golden cartridge, and Super Mario Bros. 2 doesn't even include the ability to save player progress, even though that had been available in Doki Doki Panic. Not just available, really, but featured as a key element. Doki Doki Panic required players to complete all 20 stages with all four characters in order to see the true ending, with progress toward that goal saved in a cumulative status file. The American version drops the save feature as well as the all clear requirement. Stage to stage progression happens in a strictly linear fashion here, and you don't have the option to select a different character at the beginning of each stage. It doesn't matter who you complete the game with so long as you complete it. The rub being that you only get a few lives and a couple of continues with which to pull off that feat. To make up for the loss of Doki Doki Panic's save function, Super Mario Bros. 2 takes advantage of MMC-related features. In fact, it runs on the most advanced chip available for NES at the time, the brand new MMC3, which could be seen at the same time in Japan with the October 1988 release of Super Mario Bros. 3 for Famicom. Yeah, we were a game behind. And despite running on the same format of chip, the two games didn't really compare in terms of scope or technical prowess. Mario 3 was in a class all its own employing the MMC3's high-end capabilities for a massive, freewheeling adventure in which Mario couldn't just climb vines, but could soar through the sky. Super Mario Bros. 2, on the other hand, would have worked just fine if Nintendo had carried forward with plans to release it on MMC1. That chip still enables features lacking in Doki Doki Panic, like zero loading times and enhanced sprite and background animation. And really, it's okay that Super Mario Bros. 2 doesn't compare directly to its sequel. The two games were really quite different from one another, despite both revolving around Mario leaping into action. Mario 2 has a more leisurely style, with no timers to rush you through to the end of a stage. Levels sprawl and ramble, with interlocking passages and alternate routes to your destinations. Some stages play almost like a labyrinth, forcing you to explore and experiment. Most combine vertical and horizontal elements. Many stages contain keys that you need to acquire in order to open the path forward. Every stage has a boss at the end who guards the crystal or doorway you need to liberate in order to move forward. Even the way Mario and company interact with the world works differently than in any other game in the series. Jumping on an enemy doesn't phase that foe, 
they go on about their business as usual. You can ride around on that enemy. In some cases, you can only complete a stage by hitching a ride on a creature's back to bycast a chasm or bed of spikes. You can also reach down and grab the monster you're riding, and in all but a few cases, that allows you to lift and throw the creature like a weapon. Simply tossing a creature doesn't defeat them though, unless you toss them into a pit. But if you throw one creature into another, you'll destroy them both. You can pick up items in the game to wield as weapons too. Boxes, shells, blocks, even vegetables. Vegetables most commonly appear beneath red tufts of grass scattered around the world, which you can naturally enough pluck from the ground in order to reveal the item beneath. The tufts of grass also serve as the gateway to Mario 2's primary category of secrets, subspace. A few grass tufts in each stage contain magic potions that transform into doors when shattered against the ground. Step into one of these doors and you'll appear in the reverse side of the world, a mirror image silhouette of the current stage whose boundaries are locked to the current screen of the overworld. Subspace offers two benefits. First, a few specific slices of subspace in each stage contain mushrooms, which add an extra point of health to your current character's life meter for the remainder of the stage. Mario and crew grow to supersize when their life meter has two or more full points of health, which you restore by collecting heart icons that appear after you destroy a set number of enemies. And their health tops out at four points, though it's reset to two once you advance to a new level. Grass you pluck in subspace becomes a coin, which you can cash in at the slot machine after completing a stage. Line up three matching icons on the machine and you earn an extra life, unless you happen to line up three cherries, in which case you earn five lives. Both stages allow you to enter subspace as often as you like, but you can only collect coins in your first two attempts. So it behooves you to snag as many as you can in those first two attempts, a feat made easier by playing the speedy toad, and much harder if you've selected the sluggish Luigi or princess. Although the worlds of Super Mario Bros. 2 group somewhat similarly themed stages into sets of three, outside of the ice and desert stages you won't find the sort of defining overall styles that would become a key Mario ingredient, beginning with Mario 3. However, each individual level does have its own unique feel. The desert stages of World 2 involve a great deal of digging downward into sand, while World 3 opens with a level that consists almost entirely of a trek up a waterfall. Stage 4-3 mixes things up by opening with an encounter with the standard mini-boss Birdo. This requires you to ride one of her egg projectiles across the sea to reach the main portion of the level. Once you've puzzled that out, you have to climb and then descend a pair of towers. Although, of course, you can bypass the towers altogether by harnessing Luigi's impressive jump arc to hop over a wide gap between the two towers at their bases. The various platforming challenges contained in the game's untimed stages can often be trivialized by the right character, a low-friction approach that would seem to place this game at the far extreme of the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2 in terms of its overarching design philosophy. Yet I would argue that the two games build on the same point of inspiration from the original Super Mario. Namely, that game's emphasis on unearthing secrets. They really only differ in terms of how they explore that element. The Lost Levels demanded you hone your instincts for discovery as a minimum requirement for advancement. Discover or die. Super Mario Bros. 2, on the other hand, invites you to explore at your leisure. Most stages contain a fairly direct route to the end, but you can find all kinds of interesting things by straying from that critical path. Shortcuts, power-ups, troves of grass designed for harvesting casino coin, even weird little isolated enemy encounters that you don't need to engage in for any reason besides the heck of it. By no means does this amount to a brain-dead game, though. The further you journey into Subcom, the more you need to understand and manipulate Mario 2's one-of-a-kind mechanics and physics. What initially appear to be oddities with the lift-and-throw functions become essential to advancement toward the end of the game. Everything from destroying the flooring of a space by lifting away blocks, to making use of each character's charged up super jump power. The final two stages of World 7 bring you to the Dream Factory referenced in the full Japanese title of Doki Doki Panic, where you need to make use of your full bag of tricks in order to survive a labyrinth of conveyor belts and mini-boss encounters and ultimately reach the final boss, Wart, whom you need to defeat by tossing vegetables into his mouth when he opens his maw to belch bubbles at you. It's a weird game in a lot of ways, but that seemed more or less par for the course in the 8-bit era, and NES fans were only too happy to accept Super Mario Bros. 2 on its own terms. As I've mentioned before, the fact that Westerners played this instead of the Lost Levels gave us a wildly different perception of what a Mario game should be than the vision that Japanese fans cultivated. In Japan, the Mario lineage went from Super Mario Bros. to the Lost Levels to Mario 3 to Mario Land. All fairly straightforward takes on the core Mario concept, but the biggest outlier being the Game Boy title and its offbeat mechanics and vehicle segments. 
On the other hand, the US experience took us from Super Mario Bros. to this version of Mario 2, to Super Mario Land, and finally to Super Mario Bros. 3, which fostered the impression that a Mario game can be any damn thing it wants to be. But this weirdo interpretation of Mario didn't simply vanish, not even in Japan. Nintendo reissued it as a cartridge called Super Mario USA in 1992 as a tie-in with the launch of the new, redesigned Famicom hardware. Elements and enemies from Mario 2 serviced in other Mario games soon as Super Mario Bros. 3, which includes the bob -ombs that debut here. Super Mario World's level design and exploratory feel perfectly marries the style of this game with Mario 3. And Yoshi's Island embraced Mario 2's ethos even more comprehensively, with rambling, secret-filled, untimed stages populated with subcon creatures like Shy Guys and a core mechanic that revolved around grabbing and throwing items as projectiles. In this case, swallowing and turning enemies into eggs that Yoshi can lob. Nintendo would remake Mario 2 for 16-bit as part of Super Mario All-Stars, repurpose those visuals for a strange downloadable remix for the Japan-only Satellaview service, and incorporate those remixed elements into Super Mario Advance for GBA. And the character dynamics established here in the form of playable substitutes for the original Dream Factory cast have defined the Mario franchise in both games and other media. In other words, for a Mario game that isn't actually a Mario game, Super Mario Bros. 2 sure has been important to the Mario franchise. Funny that. No conversation about Super Mario Bros. 2 would be complete without an explanation of Nintendo Power, a major key to the hype behind the game that helped turn it into a bestseller. I would argue that Nintendo Power Issue 1 amounted to the single biggest advertising campaign ever focused on any video game to that point in history. Now, it would be very foolish to say that Nintendo Power had no purpose beyond promoting a 1988 video game launch considering that it saw continuous publication for nearly a quarter of a century and spanned multiple generations of video game hardware. However, here at the beginning, Nintendo Power existed explicitly as a direct marketing tool and a massive pre-release expose on Super Mario Bros. 2 anchored its first issue and filled a great deal of the second issue as well. Nintendo Power had its origins in a slim paper mailer the company had launched a couple of years prior, the Fun Club News. Everyone who submitted a registration card for NES hardware or software ended up on the Fun Club mailing list, and the newsletter steadily grew from a slim little duotone slip of a thing to a fairly respectable full-color mini-magazine. At some point, Nintendo's marketing team surely looked at the cost involved in mailing out free, glossy, full-color magazines to millions of children and decided that maybe it might be a good idea to start charging for the privilege. And so, Fun Club News became Nintendo Power, a hefty, perfect-bound magazine that spanned around 100 pages, which would ship every other month for an annual subscription rate of about 20 bucks. Although that rate was quite a bit higher than standard magazine subscriptions at the time, which tended to come in around $5 or so, those other magazines could afford to practically give away issues for the cost of postage thanks to advertisements. Subscriber lists essentially doubled as direct marketing lists, and the larger the subscriber base for a magazine, the greater its reach and the more the publisher could afford to charge for ad space. It was to the publisher's interests to price subscriptions as cheaply as possible in order to juice up their circulation and therefore their ad rates. Nintendo Power, on the other hand, didn't include any advertising. Unless, of course, you want to consider the entire magazine an advertisement, which, in fairness, doesn't land far from the truth. Nintendo Power was a bold experiment in video game advertorial, a magazine dedicated entirely to hyping up video games for Nintendo platforms. At the beginning, of course, that meant NES releases only, but Game Boy would arrive on the scene about the time Nintendo Power hit its second year, and coverage quickly expanded to encompass hype for the handheld as well. Cynical as this setup may seem in hindsight, Nintendo Power offered far more information on upcoming NES releases than could be found anywhere else in the world. Dedicated video game magazines had all but vanished in the US following Atari's collapse, and the new wave of publications like Electronic Gaming Monthly, Game Players, and GamePro wouldn't arrive until 1989 or 90. Meanwhile, established computing magazines of the 80s, like Computer Gaming World, wouldn't give the time of day to consoles. Outside of a handful of local newspaper columns by console enthusiasts like future EGM editor Ed Simrad, who tended to be diehard Atari fans and eyed the Japan-based Nintendo with wariness, oh, and the limited circulation newsletter Computer Entertainer, which embraced the entire new wave of consoles from Nintendo, Sega, and Atari with a mix of enthusiasm and thoughtful criticism, 
hard information on NES games was difficult to come by for game-obsessed kids who thirsted to learn more about their favorite hobby. Nintendo Power offered a pure, unadulterated fire hose of hype and information about NES games, often culled from pre-release versions of cartridges. Produced largely in-house at Nintendo by the same people who reviewed games for a potential US release, Nintendo Power gave kids exhaustive views of games that wouldn't ship here for months. Being an in-house publication, of course, everything about Nintendo Power came couched in positive terms. Even commentary on bad games employed a fair amount of doublespeak to avoid saying anything decisively negative. It didn't take long for canny readers to get a sense for reading between the lines. Great games tended to enjoy lengthy, dynamic photo spreads that blurred the line between preview and strategy guide. Mediocre games typically received a small box out with a couple of screenshots and a few paragraphs of text tiptoeing around their flaws and poor games would get the nod of a brief sentence confirming their existence. Coverage in Nintendo Power didn't really fall into the tidy categories under which the modern game press organizes its content. A preview doubled as a guide, and in many ways as a review. Games were simply covered, irrespective of that coverage's relationship to the actual release date of the game in question. The magazine's second issue, for example, arrived in early autumn, but devoted tons of space to games that had shipped in the first half of the year, such as Renegade and RC Pro-Am. Games tended to have a different life cycle in the NES era than they do now, with ambiguous release dates, uneven distribution to retail, and a tendency to retain their full sticker price for far longer than they do today. As such, it made sense for Nintendo Power to push games that still had legs, even months after release, especially considering that some of those old games were effectively still new for people who had just acquired an NES, or whose local retailers had been slow to order. The first issue of Nintendo Power arrived in the early summer of 1988, quite a ways ahead of Super Mario Bros. 2 appearance at retail in October, but just close enough to whet NES fans' appetites up until the holiday season. And it had millions of appetites to whet. Although Nintendo would sell Nintendo Power via a subscription model, rather than a new stand edition, in the classic pusher style, the first one was free. Nintendo shipped more than three and a half million copies of Nintendo Power No. 1 to everyone on the Fun Club News subscriber list, effectively providing us with a massive direct mailer ad for Super Mario Bros. 2 and some backup features to coax us through the second quest of Zelda and promote a handful of other recent releases. I can't think of a bigger or more costly promotional effort for a single game to that point in history than the amount of money Nintendo sank into this mailing alone. It paid off though, according to multiple sources referenced on Wikipedia, Nintendo has sold as many copies of Super Mario Bros. 2 by 1990 as copies of Nintendo Power No. 1 that had shipped out, and the game ultimately became the single best-selling NES release never to have been distributed as a hardware packet. Even after new gaming publications appeared on the US market, Nintendo Power still occupied a unique niche. Others took a platform-agnostic approach, dedicating plenty of pages to non-Nintendo systems, especially once the 16-bit era kicked off and actively criticizing substandard Nintendo platform releases. Other magazines also dealt in rumors and import coverage that ranged beyond Nintendo's own marketing plans, or that presented the company in an unfavorable light. Certainly you didn't see factual reporting on Tengen's friction with NES licensing rules in the pages of Nintendo's own in-house publication. But for those who simply wanted an early peek at the best and brightest software lined up for NES and its successors, Nintendo Power eagerly wrapped them in a warm blanket of fandom and garish layouts. The high-energy page designs had become an iconic part of Nintendo Power's appeal. I remember one mainstream news publication at the time referring to the aesthetic of Nintendo Power as peanut butter and jelly layouts, which seems right on the money. Colorful, messy, and undeniably childish. It's satisfying. Nintendo Power's look stood out among US-based publications in large part because the magazine layout didn't happen in the US. Nintendo teamed up with Japanese publisher Tokuma Shoten, who applied a decidedly Japanese-style youth publication discipline to their layouts. Text splashed at odd angles, explosive box outs, and display type surrounding a collage of screenshots, descriptive text, and original artwork. Nintendo's internal editorial team created the text and other content, led by editor Gil Tilden and supported by NOA stalwarts like Howard Phillips, who appeared dispensing game tips in cartoon form each issue as the gallant foil to a goofus strawman punk kid named Nestor. That material then made its way across the Pacific via courier and fax to Tokuma Shoten, who handled layouts and paste up and returned the flats to Nintendo for printing. This gave Nintendo power a cross-cultural feel, lacking in more buttoned-down American gaming publications. 
The closest thing to Nintendo's look and style could be found in the moderately energetic EGM, which had glibly swiped Weekly Famitsu's cross-review format, among other concepts, but still looked fairly staid in comparison to Nintendo Power. Tokuma Shoten's layouts didn't always hit the mark, but when they worked, they worked. They had a keen eye for talent, giving future international illustrator superstar Katsuya Tarada his break, and later recruiting the legendary creator of Cyborg 009, Shotaro Ishinomori, to pen a multi-part serial manga based on The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Nintendo Power became a crucial tool for the NES fan. Its maps and tips sections often proved essential for the platform's more cryptic games. Would anyone have known what to do in Castlevania II without Nintendo Power's comprehensive explanations? or have been able to work their way through the broken, untelegraphed hell that is Metal Gear's desert sequence, the magazine quickly insinuated itself into NES fan culture, with legendary events and memorable covers and special issues. For instance, Nintendo used Nintendo Power as a lever to build enthusiasm for role-playing games among an unfamiliar US audience. Introducing the term RPG to NES kids with issue 3's spread on Ultima Exodus and Legacy of the Wizard. One issue included a dedicated insert to Dragon Warrior, and the following year saw an entire special issue devoted to Final Fantasy along with a massive contest to promote the game. And when that didn't help move the frumpy looking Dragon Warrior, Nintendo Power gave away new copies of the game to new subscribers as a way to drum up magazine circulation while clearing unsold game inventory. Other first parties would imitate Nintendo Power with dedicated marketing publications like Sega Visions, but none ever managed to achieve the same clout as Nintendo's venture. Even Nintendo Power couldn't match itself. As the gaming landscape expanded beyond the Nintendo hegemony, during the 16-bit era, the magazine's upbeat, insular approach began to feel tin-eared and hollow. Still, looking back at the NES era, much of the cultural lore around the games of 1988 through 91 came from the pages of Nintendo Power. That includes games that never ultimately shipped in the US, including the original Mother, and countless other titles listed briefly in the Pack Watch section before vanishing forever into the ether. Even with its checkered legacy, Nintendo Power played an important part and helped propel many games that might otherwise have been overlooked into the spotlight. The NES simply wouldn't have been the same without it, for better and for worse. With the arrival of Super Mario Bros. 2, the lead feature in the debut issue of Nintendo Power, I'm going to begin including a sidebar in each episode of NES Works called What Did Nintendo Power Say? Looking at official coverage of the game in question. In the case of Super Mario Bros. 2, Nintendo Power devoted 29 pages in total to the game across its first two issues, introducing the characters, mechanics, and basic strategies for the first nine stages of the adventure. Naturally, you won't find a negative word about the game in these spreads. Nintendo Power had a job to do, and that job was selling you a copy of Super Mario Bros. 2. The coverage does include a few oddities and other items of interest, like an original two-page illustration that depicts the entire cast of characters heroes and villains alike, competing in a free-for-all Olympic-style contest, as well as a few space fillers pointing out minor game glitches. Issue 4 notably contains a handful of Q&A solutions to some of the more vexing in-game moments, like riding Birdo's egg across the water in World 4. Or is that Ostro's egg? The magazine can't seem to make up its mind. Look, it was the 80s. Style guides for video game magazines didn't exist yet. Heck, video game magazines barely existed yet. Next time on NES Works. Frog Blast Event Card!